Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Remember to like and subscribe for more clearly defined relationships next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building the Ice Climbers because Wonder Woman got delayed again and I needed to fill the slot I had for Cheetah. Spoilers I guess, Cheetah is coming when Wonder Woman 1984 comes out. But until then, I've got another character to fill out my Smash Bros roster and to use a subclass from Wild Mount. I guess I should have expected the Ice Climbers to be a twofer. I can almost see it, that dream I'm dreaming, but there's a voice inside my head saying, you'll never reach it. Every step I'm taking, every move I make feels lost with no direction. My faith is shaken, but I, I gotta keep trying. Gotta keep my head held high. This is for you. There's always gonna be another mountain. I'm always gonna wanna make it move. Always gonna be an uphill battle. Sometimes I'm gonna have to lose. Ain't about how fast I get there. Ain't about what's waiting on the other side. It's the Climbers! I'm doing the Ice Climbers instead. Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need to have dependency issues with a partner to help us fight. I believe it's confirmed that the Climbers are siblings, but that's because they had to make it clear later. The lore from their games is two people who climb mountain made of ice. So if you don't mind, we're gonna make our own backstory, which is what you should be doing anyway. The next thing we need is an ancient bloodline full of ice magic to give us cryomantic abilities. See? Original backstory, it's fun. Finally, we'll get hammers that weeble and wobble so our enemies fall down. Dead. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep your strength and charisma high enough for multiclassing. Constitution will be number one. High altitude requires thick skin and thick coats, but anyone can wear a parka. Strength next, you and your partner both use hammers as your weapon of choice. Clearly, someone at Nintendo in the NES era really liked carpentry. Charisma after that, if you look chibi enough, people are gonna struggle to hit you. Follow that up with dexterity. A heavy coat is not heavy armor. Probably something in the padded leather area, which means we're gonna need this to not get hit all the time. Wisdom is a bit low, we'll get some skills to round out what I want from here, and we'll dump intelligence. Your school got destroyed when the Fire Nation attacked. Maybe. I don't know. Racially, the climbers are short, sweet, and they don't need the heat because of the insulation. Or because they're stout halflings. Who's to say? Me. This is my video. Stout halflings get plus two to dexterity and plus one to constitution. You're lucky enough to reroll ones on attack rolls, ability checks, and saving throws. You're brave, giving you advantage on saving throws against being frightened, and your stout resilience gives you advantage on saves against being poisoned and resistance to poison damage, which could help you deal with some plants and white Pikmin, which I think are also plants. God help me, what am I going to do for Alamar? Shepherd Druid with Awaken, you conjure some Fae as Pikmin. Sorry, I can't turn off. Take the Outlander background for athletics and survival skills. Both are pretty good for mountain climbers, and that's your entire identity. We'll kick things off as a fighter, letting us grab two skills from the fighter list. Acrobatics and animal handling could be useful on the mountaintop. For your fighting style, great weapon fighting lets you reroll ones and twos on damage die with weapons you're holding two-handed. If there's one thing the Ice Climbers are great at, it's racking up the percent. I'll recommend a Warhammer. It's not heavy, but it is versatile, meaning that you can hold it two-handed to deal 1d10 bludgeoning damage instead of 1d8. You also get Second Wind, letting you heal 1d10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action once per short rest, obviously because you're eating your vegetables. Second level fighters get Action Surge, letting you make two actions in the same turn once per short rest, which is kind of what makes our subclass busted. What subclass, you ask? Well, third level fighters can become Echo Knights, a new subclass from friend of the show, Matthew Mercer. I've never met him or spoken to him, but he seems nice. I bet he'd be my friend. It lets you manifest an Echo, which is a ghostly image that looks like you, and you can attack through its space or yours on your turn. You can move it 30 feet on your turn and teleport to its space as a bonus action by pressing up B, and you can make opportunity attacks from its location. It only has 1 HP and AC equal to 14 plus your proficiency bonus while using your scores for saving throws and being immune to every condition. If you want double trouble, this is the way to build it. Unless you're building double trouble from She-Ra, then like, 
Changeling Bard, probably. There, now you get three builds in this video, which is already kind of a double build. You're welcome. For the busted part of the subclass, Unleash Incarnation lets you make one more attack as part of an attack action an amount of times equal to your constitution modifier per long rest. Since your action surge lets you make another attack action, that means you can make four attacks in one turn at level three, which I guess monks can do too, but you can do it with hammers and a ghost twin, so that's cooler. Fourth level fighters get an ability score improvement. Let's start investing in our strength. In addition to hammer hits, it also is related to your grapple checks. If you got into melee combat, I feel like that could be pretty good. Worth noting that the echo can't grapple because technically it's not a creature, but it is a friend and the ghost of someone close to you who died while you were climbing the mountain. It's a rich fiction we're building. Fifth level fighters get extra attack, meaning that you can attack twice with your attack action. This does not create two attack actions though, so you can still only unleash the incarnation once per turn or twice with your action surge because that creates a second attack action, if that's clear. If it's not, I don't know. I can't hear you. I wish I could. No, I don't. Now that I'm thinking about it, that sounds awful. Sixth level fighters get another ability score improvement, more strength, more hammers, more big kablammers, that's what I always say. From now on, whenever I build a character with an identical person who wields hammers and has ice powers. Oh, I forgot the ice powers. Bouncing over to sorcerer, specifically a draconic bloodline sorcerer with a white dragon. While you're brave as a halfling, one of your ancestors was very brave as a halfling. Since you have a white dragon ancestor, you can double your proficiency bonus on persuasion checks with dragons, and you have draconic resilience for plus one HP every time you take a sorcerer level, and a base AC of 13 plus your dexterity modifier. It's supposed to be a coat of scales, but what if it was a coat of scales? A ling, a mountain. How about that? This is my favorite video I've recorded in a long time. Fury Cantrip's Ray of Frost is a ranged spell attack that deals 2d8 cold damage and reduces a target's speed by 10 feet, which could work well for an icicle toss. Frostbite forces a constitution saving throw of 8 plus your proficiency bonus and charisma modifier on a creature within 60 feet of you, dealing 2d6 cold damage and giving them disadvantage on their next attack, probably because they're frozen. You get two more cantrips, but I really don't know which ones I'd take. Light creates a light if you don't have dark vision. True Strike is a great spell to make people angry in your comment section because even though this has been in running bit for two months, people still feel the need to be upset by it. Remember, free video content still takes time and effort to produce, so if you're mad at anyone on YouTube for wanting agency, over the content they produce, you're a jerk. For your first level spells, jump triples the jump distance of a creature of your choice for a minute, no concentration required because you're from a platformer and your airspeed isn't bad in the fighting game either. Ice Knife lets you make a ranged spell attack that deals 1d10 piercing damage, then forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 5 foot radius, dealing 2d6 cold damage to those that fail, if you need a strong zoning option. Second level sorcerers get a font of magic full of sorcery points you can use to recover sorcery points. Thanks to the new class feature variants on Earth Arcana, you can use Imbuing Touch to turn a weapon magical for a minute so you don't have any trouble dealing damage to barbarians in Smash. Obviously, you got magical hammers. Empowered Reserves gives you advantage on an ability check, and Sorcerer's Fortitude lets you give yourself a d4 of temporary HP for each point you spend. If your DM doesn't like on Earth Arcana, I'm sorry. Not because you can't use this, just sounds like a boring campaign. I'm kidding, if more rules is more fun to you, that's great. The only thing that matters is that people are having fun. For this level spell, Featherfall prevents five falling creatures from taking falling damage as a reaction, which should be pretty useful for, you know, climbing mountains. Third level sorcerers get meta magic, letting you augment your spells with sorcery points. Extended spell doubles the spell's duration to last for a whole timed match. Though if someone's playing time in Smash Bros, do you really want to play longer? Twin Spell lets you cast a spell that normally only targets one person and make it target two person, spending an amount of sorcery points equal to the level of spell cast. I'd use it for a spell like Hold Person, which paralyzes a humanoid that fails a wisdom saving throw, freezing them in place. Like with Ice. That's cause like that's what you do. Fourth level sorcerers get an ability score improvement letting us cap off our strength modifier, something every sorcerer should try to do, obviously. For this level spell, Snillock Snowball Swarm forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a five foot radius sphere, dealing 3d6 cold damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. It can do 18 damage. That's so much. With extra attack, action surge, and two unleashed incarnations on a paralyzed target from hold person, you deal 12d10 plus 30 bludgeoning damage, which is a little bit more. So maybe, maybe do that instead. 
Fifth level sorcerers can escalate that further with third level spells like Haste, which gives a creature you touch plus two AC, advantage on dexterity saves, doubled movement speed, and an extra action you can use for another attack action, though it specifies you only get one attack. Still, because it's an attack action, you can unleash another incarnation. Of course, this does require concentration, so you can't have hold person while doing this to get those crits off, and if you lose concentration, you can't take actions or reactions for a round, but they last for a minute, depending on your concentration, so you'll be able to get plenty done before it wears off. Sixth level dragon sorcerers get elemental affinity, letting you add your charisma modifier to the damage of cold attacks thanks to your ancient white dragon relative. You can also spend a sorcery point to get resistance to cold damage for an hour as your scaling coat gets a little warmer. For this level spell, Sleet Storm creates a 40 foot tall, 20 foot radius sphere of hail that heavily obscures the area, turns it into difficult terrain, forces constitution checks on casters, and dexterity saving throws on everyone else inside, knocking them prone if they fail. Lasts for a minute depending on your concentration, but I'd probably use the other concentration spells you have. We're really just here for the cold resistance from the Draconic Soul. Back over to Fighter, 7th level Echo Knights can use an Echo Avatar, letting you send your partner up the mountain using their senses. During this time, you're blinded and deafened because you switched climbers. It can for up to 10 minutes and the other climber can explore a thousand feet away from you before disappearing until this is done obviously it's better if you stick together Scouting is also useful, do whatever you want. Eighth level fighters get another ability score improvement or a feat. The Great Weapon Master feat lets you take a negative five penalty to attack rolls to add 10 to the damage rolls and make another attack as a bonus action if you critically hit or reduce someone to zero HP. This mixes very well with Hold Person since you'll have advantage on rolls to help you deal with the penalty and automatically crit when you hit. So the bonus action is guaranteed. Maybe it wasn't clear yet, but the Ice Climbers are gonna be one of the strongest builds I've ever built. The ice Ice climbers can beat Doomsday in a fight. Let that sink in. Ninth level fighters get indomitable, letting you reroll a failed saving throw once per long rest. Sometimes they think they hit Popo, but the game says nah. Nah. I made this build to make these puns. This is what I am here for. 10th level fighters get Shadow Martyr, letting you use your reaction to send your Echo in to take a hit for you or another creature you can see. The Echo goes within 5 feet of that creature and the attack has to hit the Echo instead, either destroying it or missing it because your Echo's AC is 19, which is honestly pretty good. You can only do this once per short rest because the guilt of sacrificing the visage of your ally who died on the mountain overwhelms you. This is just like what happened on the mountain. They said they wanted you to live, but you haven't felt alive since you watched them fall. Anyway, 11th level fighters get another extra attack, so 3 attacks with your action, 4 with your echo, 5 with a haste action, 6 with an echo after haste, 9 with an action surge, and 10 after a post action surge echoing. That's 10d10 10 10 plus 150 damage if they're all great weapon master hits, or if you'd rather use this on a frozen creature you've used hold person on, it would be less attacks, but all crits for 18d10 10 plus 135 damage, which can all be magical with imbued touch, so resistances shouldn't be an issue. The thing at the top of the mountain brought your partner back, but its bloodlust is unquenchable. 12th level fighters get an ability score improvement. More constitution will give you more extra hits from your fellow climber per day and an extra 18 HP at this point because HP levels retroactively, making it quite the little tank. 13th level fighters get another use of Indomitable. Just because you can't save your partner doesn't mean you can't save yourself. Heck, you can use these on death saving throws to be the Sopo or Sona that just can't be killed for some reason. Our capstone is the 14th level of fighter for another ability score improvement. Let's cap off our constitution to keep ourselves warm in the coldest, emptiest of nights. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you are the twin gods of death, dealing absolutely insane damage with your hammers, and you can make it all magical if it needs to be. You're also incredibly tanky, with well over 200 HP, as long as you didn't roll like hot garbage on your hit die. Finally, you've got great mobility. If you're hasted, you've got 60 feet of base movement. With jump, you can make a 60 foot horizontal and 24 foot vertical hop. Even though you're only three feet tall, that's adorable. For weaknesses, you got a lot of concentration spells, and it doesn't matter if your modifier is capped, you can still only have one up at a time. You also focused on the physical, meaning your saving throws and spell attacks aren't great. Finally, lower intelligence and wisdom sets you up to take some nasty saving throws yourself. But this is no joke, one of the strongest builds we've ever made. Climb the mountain and come back down with the power only you, your partner, and God need to know about. Just watch out for mind flayers. Maybe there are mind flayers in your lore, I don't know. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, subscribe for more. We make two videos every week. The footage for this episode comes from our side channel, Tulak and Mango, where my buddy Mango got trained by someone who's good at Smash, unlike me. Special thanks to Neighbor for helping out with that. Follow him on Twitter at TheRyanNeighbor if you want to read about cool Smash stuff.